A friend of mine came back and she'd been in Paris um, and she brought me a bottle of this and I was like, well, you know, why would I want to drink Chardonnay with this beautiful cheese? <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> like really, really stupid. Hi, I'm Derek Morrison from The Good Wine Shop, and welcome to episode two of Bring Your Own. Today's session is all about the wines from the Jura region of France. While the region is perhaps best known for Comté cheese and Louis Pasteur, it's also home to some of France's most exciting wines, including the timeless and iconic Van Jones. We've gathered a group of fanatical Jura lovers to share bottles from their own cellars and to chat about what makes the region's wines and people so unique and captivating. Joining us are wine exporter Alessio Guidi, Jura wine importer Doug Regg from Le Cave de Perenne, Heidi Nam Knutson from Ottolanghi Restaurant Group, and David Clausen from the Remedy Wine Bar. We're really lucky to be hosted by the great team at Kitchen Table and Bubble Dogs in central London for the filming of this episode. Tucked in the back of Bubble Dogs on Charlotte Street, Kitchen Table is one of the most exciting restaurants in London, led by owner Chef James Knappett. You can find them online at www.kitchentablelondon.co.uk. Due to the nature of filming in a working restaurant, please excuse the various machine noises you may hear in the background, as well as the bustling bar. I hope you'll enjoy the episode. Follow us on social media at BYO Podcast and subscribe to the podcast to make sure you catch all future episodes. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we'll start around just go with a quick introduction. So we'll start with you, David. Absolutely. I own a little tiny wine bar called The Remedy. Been sort of doing this for a little while now. Clearly, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from the country, but uh, been here a long time and the wines of the Jura Gosh, I mean, it's an honor to be a part of this podcast. It's one of my big passions in life, um, that region, the wines, the people. Um, you know, been there many times, and it's just a really special region, and I'm sure we'll get into all those reasons why, but thanks for having me. I'm Alessio Guidi. Um, I've been informed that I should be using my uh, nom de plume, uh, <laughs> uh, or, you know, self-styled wine scumbag. Um, no, well, I'm, I'm a wine lover, most for, first and foremost, a uh, drinker. Um, and I work for, um, I represent several wineries from Italy, uh, Europe, Japan, Russia. My company is owned by Avignonese in Tuscany. But, you know, Jura is a great passion of mine, as, uh, you know, is easy to say. But um, it's one of those regions that really get into you and you dream them at night. And, uh, and, you know, you wake up in the morning and, you know, you still want to learn more and you want to drink more. And every time there's a Jura tasting, that's, uh, you know, a very cool moment. Heidi. Hi, um, I'm Heidi and I, um, I buy wine for um, a restaurant group called Atulengi. Um, and I've been buying wines for them for about seven years now. Um, and originally I grew up in Denmark and I came to London in sort of the mid 90s. And um, I wasn't really that into wine. Um, the first few times I drank wine, I had a really bad reaction. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of left wine for a while. Um, but this was sort of in the mid 90s where everyone was doing, uh, everyone wanted to be a a mixologist, it was called, um, and um, there was this amazing guy, Dick Bratzel, who was the king of Soho and cocktails. Um, so I went to train as a cocktail bartender and um, was always really into uh, mixing flavors and um, spirits. Um, and it wasn't until uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I started sort of, I had a wine that sort of really moved me and I kind of thought, okay, now I can start drinking wine. and. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy and honored to be here, like everyone else. Um, Jura is such a, for me, it's such a mystical place, and um, I actually only went for the first time this year. Um, but yeah, I hope to go back many times again. Do you still remember the wine that was your? Wine it was actually, epiphany? yeah, it was, um, it was a Grüner Veltliner from Meinklang. <laughs> so it was just really different to anything I'd had before. So I'd worked in restaurants for many years, and. Um, I'd had training on um, uh, Spanish wines, um, but um, none of the wines really moved me. I understood them, and um, I could taste them, and I could match them with the food in the restaurants, uh, but somehow I couldn't connect with them, and it wasn't until I, I had one uh, this wine, and I just thought, okay, this is something different, and, um, and it felt like it was, maybe it was because it felt to me it was more like food, than, than wine. There was something nutritious in this wine that really connected with me. And so I thought I'd, I'd found my answer. So I thought if I just go out and buy all the organic wines out there, that's it. And then, you know, I soon realized just because it says organic doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> so, so yeah, but that's how my whole interest in wine began. And Doug, 
Welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Doug. Um, I work for a company called Le Cave de Perrin. Um, we specialize in organic biodynamic and natural wines. We have over 2,000 wines on our list now, which is, makes it quite difficult. <laughs> Name them all now. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I'm, I, I'm responsible for trying to reduce the stock personally. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I talk about wine epiphanies. But, well, I was born in the States and I came over here and basically my introduction to wine was, was my dad who, who, um, who would buy wine from Augustus Barnett in Odbins in the 70s when you could buy like a Petrus for like six pounds and I didn't really care because um, um, I preferred the taste of lemon peel soaked in vermouth. That was my, that was my first introduction to booze and, and, having, and having a literal sort of thimble full of cider and giggling for about three days afterwards. But I was young, so that was fair enough. And at some point, um, I gravitated towards our family restaurant in South Kensington, and I was given, uh, God knows what they were thinking, the custody of the wine list, which had won Best London Wine List uh, Award for the Egon Ronai. And uh, I, I had that little responsibility to try to sort of like maintain that quality. Well, anyway, so I managed, funny enough, I managed to win the award next year, and then I moved somewhere else and won the award again. So it was more by luck than judgment. Uh, I just I was just quite good at sort of writing tasting notes and I was quite sort of personable in terms of the way I sold wine because I had no knowledge really. So in all innocence I was quite good at communicating. Uh, so then I worked as a sommelier for a few years and I was really lucky to work in a restaurant which had a fabulous wine list of nearly a thousand bins and basically I tried every classic great wine probably made between the 1950s to the to the sort of like late 1990s, you know, from Margot to Cheval Blanc. So, you know, as a sommelier, you have a special privilege. I, I never nicked any wine, you know, without telling the customers that I was going to do it first. Um, so I had a lot of wine epiphanies, but I think my first wine epiphany, my greatest wine epiphany, and it still is, is um, was a Bordeaux epiphany. And like, go shoot me for, for saying that, because now I don't touch the stuff if I can possibly help it. Um, and it was in the Outer Hebrides and um, it, I can't remember the year, but I think it was the late 80s. And um, we ate in a restaurant uh, in a, on a little hotel on, the, on this island in the Isle of Harris. And uh, we, we couldn't drink the whole bottle because my mother was driving back. Um, we got out of the car. We lived on a little cottage by the sea and we started to drink from the bottle and at that point there was a full milky way but there's also shooting stars and the sound of the sea and the mountains in the background and it was just a cosmic event i'm not sure the wine was any good but the wine it was a fairly cosmic event and i thought oh i really you know i would love to remember what i'm drinking now and of course i completely forgot as you do and then 15 years later i went back to the island and funnily enough i met the guy who sold me the wine and I said, I don't suppose in a million years he could possibly remember what it was you sold. He said, yeah, it was Chateau Torbeau, 1978. I thought, like, you've got an amazing memory. Surely enough wine has flown under the bridge uh, to be able to forget that event. Anyway, so now when I think of Chateau Torbeau, 78, I think of shooting stars, epiphanies, <laughs> and I can describe you exactly the way it tastes, and I can't describe what I had five minutes ago. That's a powerful epiphany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think my favorite thing, I've, I've never heard of someone describe their wine epiphany as a cosmic event. Yes, <laughs> and, and I but the cosmos it. was in tune with what I was experiencing, I think. <laughs> no, fantastic. So everyone brought a bottle of wine tonight. Um, we'll start with Doug. Doug, uh, tell us what you brought and uh, why you brought it. So I brought a Pulsar, sometimes called Plusar, um, if you're a wine nerd or you're from Jura. Um, and the reason why I brought it is because I really like the grape. It's a bit of an ornery, sort of difficult grape, uh, but it, to me it's synonymous with, with Jura um, because it is a native grape. Um, Poussin and Sauvignon sort of seem to go hand in hand. They also tend to grow on the same sort of soils, which are sort of gray marls or red marls, so often they're co-planted. Um, to, to me, I, I, you know, everyone will have brought a fantastic white wine and I just want something which is very very drinkable and the essence of Jura red wines is, is their freshness that lightness and their drinkability um, that's the reason why I brought the grape variety um, then I brought the grower Jean-Francois Ganevin also called Fan Fan to his friends and enemies alike I'm sure and to his fans and to his fan fans even um, and yes I can riff on that for a long time uh, and maybe I shouldn't um, 
<laughs> anyway, so um, he's in the he's in the south of Jura, not in a little hamlet called Rotalier, and it's not really an area where a lot of people w work. So he's pretty sort of unique. When he first started making wines many years ago, um, the company I work for received big allocations of, of his wines, and he basically did his sort of like his work experience in, in Burgundy and wanted to make sort of quite Burgundian style wines. And his whites are quite Burgundian and his reds, but his reds were sort of Burgundian in the wrong sense of the word. Because to me, Jura has a very sort of unique, uh, and the wines have a very unique feel and I, and I want the wines to really reflect where they come from and, and reflect the culture and reflect the sort of food. But he was making sort of Burgundian reds, new oak, cold maceration, really dark, intense, almost chocolatey wines. And we received huge allocations of these things. And of course, we couldn't sell them. Now we really love the wines and we get minute allocations of everything. <laughs> yep, that's, uh, that's irony for you. Um, anyway, so he certainly changed his style of winemaking, I guess, about seven or eight years ago. He started pursuing a more natural path. He started to identify terroir and what, which were good vineyards. But Pulsar is definitely the one he makes least of. Um, I mean, just literally two barrels. And uh, funny enough, in I th well, I say funny enough, that's not funny at all, really. And I think in the 216 vintage, one of the barrels exploded. So it's so so there's like one barrel. So so allocations were halved, and the allocations were already tiny. So everyone was on their knees begging for for nothing, really. Um, but each year that went by, his wines became more and more minimalist. And to me, I love a wine which has almost nothing, you know, to play with. You know, it's just a line of, of, of fruit or, or minerality. It's lean, it's pure, it's fresh. There's no fat on it. It's absolutely light and bright and crisp and clean. This wine uh, I chose in the 2014 vintage, which was quite a difficult vintage. So ripeness was, 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 was difficult, uh, and yet it achieved its full ripeness at 10%. And 10% in, in an era of global warming is, and, and full ripeness, is, to me, is, is admirable. And uh, it made us think that actually, if we were to plant a grape variety in the UK, we would plant Pulsar because it, it would be ripe at 8%. And it didn't have to have any color. And Pulsar has no color at all. So it looks a bit like rosé in the glass. And the difference between a Pulsar rosé and a Pulsar red is, is indistinguishable almost. So really, really pale, really pure. And of course, it doesn't take oak, new oak at all. So it's all about big old barrels, you know, foudre. And, it's, and, and they're just there to caress the wine and caress the red fruit. And the fruit is red fruit, and I love red fruit. I love it on Pinot Noir. I love it on Plusard and Trousseau. I, lo I love elegance and freshness and brightness and, and beauty and transparency. And this wine has all of those. And to me, it shows how Ganavar has, has come along. Really, he's had a sort of journey himself, a bit of an epiphany in terms of winemaking. And his, his, white, his reds have become more and more minimalist, which I think is true in the way that Jura reds should be drunk today or you know literally or, or tomorrow um, and they're they're always of the vintage ahead and the whites are much more considerable they're much more structured you know they uh, they have longer elevage more time in the lees um, and they can be aged for 10 15 20 30 plus years but um, sometimes we have to drink wine now we can't really wait that long it's the same way they drink it in the Jura too yeah I mean they actually start yes. always with reds and then they have whites mm -hmm. great segue to get the wine in the glass so if you notice the color, it's, it's amazing, you know, it's so light. And sometimes we're looking for density uh, of color. And, and, but actually what I like to do is to look and, and actually if you hold it up, um, it, it's, it seems to be almost like browning or orangey brown, uh, but uh, it really holds, it's really attractive the way it holds the light. And I always think that's a sign of a really healthy wine. But that is the classic Poussard color when you, when you hold it up. It, and as I say, it looks a bit like a sort of like a, a slightly sort of muddy colored rosé. Um, and then um, on, on the nose, you say I'm a real sucker for sort of red fruits and a slight earthiness um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the aromatics. It's not a complex spectrum. Um, and although it's only 10 percent, but I, I, I still feel that it fills out the mouth with interesting, subtle flavors. But Pulsar has always been this sort of like, although it's this, it's it's the most grown red grape in, in Jura, like so precedes uh, Pinot and Trousseau. Um, it's the one that you don't see very often on wine lists in this country, uh, because I think people find it very difficult to understand. They're saying, where's the wine gone? You know, like, where's the color? Can I have some more color, some more extraction, some more, you know, like richness? And you're looking for something that isn't there and has never been there. So just leave it to be what it is. But in fact, you have bags of flavor, even though, you know, as you say, it's only 10%. Uh, it's just, I think they've got, the, there is this, um, this thing that among uh, 
consumers is that the more color, the more complexity, the more quality, the more everything. But it's actually, for me, the other way around, you know, you get more complexity, uh, 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 also in great varieties that at first look, you know, you, mm. you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't give a chance. So, you know, Pulsar, I mean, it's finicky, as you said, Doug, and you've got a lot of, um, you know, it's the most difficult grape to grow in Jura. But when it, when it comes out right, I mean, the bags of flavors, you know, they're not intense. They're just chiseled, detailed, and, you know, you have to go look for them. They don't scream. And that's, I think, one of the big plus <coughs> of Pulsar, you know, it, it shoe shot. You know, it, uh, uh, I think it's one of the most ethereal grapes too of the Jura. Yeah. Um, to me, it's one of the most ethereal grapes. Actually, I I know full stop. Um, it just has that essence about it that, as you say, it's kind of come hither. It's like you know you can't quite find it. You're looking, you're searching, and then it leaps out at you for a second, and then it's gone. And it's that kind of uh, it's just got tease. this this wonderful you know subtlety to it. I mean, this uh, this understatement, uh, um, this whisper, I guess, of elegance. It's not you know as you say, it doesn't scream at you. And you know as as you kind of alluded to with some of the great whites of Jura, they can be really quite, I mean, um, exuberant, uh, let's say, and, and this has a definite nice contrast, but uh, in, a, in a befitting way as well. I mean, I, I, my favorite wines from Jura tend to be these ethereal, you know, um, hard to define wines, and, and um, there's many different personalities with that, and this is kind of another expression that way. But it's, the color is amazing. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it looks like a 40-year-old you know, Burgundy or you know, <laughs> Barolo or something like that. I find this, this lovely mouthfeel is quite, um, it's quite uh, embracing as well in the mouth. It's not, it's not usually, you know, you find, regard, you know, depending on where you grow. I mean, the Sud Revermont, you know, where uh, Garibar is, tends to, be, tends to be a bit warmer, you know, lower elevation. So you get a little more, you know, roundness around the edges. But I think it works perfect in the, in the context of the wine. I mean, it's, I think you get the line of acid. I mean, yeah. what Prusar has is acid. What, what Trousseau, it's mm. like other grape is, is more about tannin and yeah. color and structure. It's a bit like Barbera and Dolcetto. They're sort of opposites. Um, and you look at it, you see it's very shiny. Uh, you know, that's always a sign of, of, of elevated acidity, uh, which, which I love it because it's thirst quenching yeah. just naturally. I think it's quite easy to pair with food because the acid acidity cuts through, through sort of like porky things and sort of like, you know, slow cooked dishes. So the other thing to note, I guess, is, it, it, you know, it's a more, so I suppose a more modern style of winemaking, the sort of carbonic maceration or semi-carbonic, I guess, in this case, you know, using whole bunches and that lovely stemmy, edgy freshness yeah. that gives a line going through the wine, which I think is, is really appealing. And I think once upon a time, Ganevar would not have been doing this. He would have been macerating the grapes. Um, there's no pump overs, you know, no, no, no punch downs or pump overs. And I think, again, this is a more, I would say it's, it should be a traditional way of winemaking. I think it's a more modern approach, uh, a more subtle approach to just leave the wine be, let, let it cook in its own time, no sulfur added, you know, nothing, no filtration. And it's, it becomes harmonious, I think, that much more quickly because it's treated really gently. This is a 60 year old vineyard. Um, as Lissier says, I mean, like, he's not particularly high up, although actually, funny enough, uh, some of his Chardonnay vineyards are amongst the highest in Jura at 400 meters. So, you know, you have a reasonable elevation in Jura. It's, it's pretty well 300 and above, which I suppose is pretty similar to Burgundy. Um, yes, the, 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 I think the soils in Jura are pretty unique, uh, whereas obviously in Burgundy you have limestone and clay. In Jura you have this collision between Burgundy and, and the subalpine soil. So you have, you have a mosaic of different soils. And, and where Ganevar comes into his own in his completely crazy way is to make 45 to 50 different cuvées mm -hmm. because he vinifies by plot, by, by different soil types. So it's Chardonnay or Sauvignon um, or even Pinot Noir, uh, you know, um, per, per plot. Now, the vast majority of what he does is white, uh, so you know it's nice to be reminded that those reds are absolutely delicious. But to me, he's quite Burgundian in the style of winemaking because he really, really wants to bring out terroir, and and ultimately that's what we're looking for is is something which is really expressive. And his his wines are totally delineated. You can tell the difference between each cuvee if they, you lined them all up blind. You'd say, yes, that's Grus, that's Florine, that's, um, you know, Grand Tep, that's Chalas, you know. And, you know, and it, it just shows you red marls, blue marls, gray marls, whatever it is, limestone. They all have this very strong inflection, you know, or influence on the wine. And, um, and he really respects that. I mean, he would be crazy to make that many cuvées otherwise. 
So Heidi, do you want to tell us about uh, the wine you brought tonight? Absolutely. Um, so I bought, uh, brought a 100% um, Chardonnay from uh, Loctola, um, Alice Beauvau. Um, it's called Pamina. Um, I tried this for the first time, I think, uh, nine, ten years ago. I was working for, um, before I was at Otolenghi, I was working for Whole Foods Market. Um, and I was doing all the cheese and wine stuff uh, in the flagship store in Kensington. Um, and I just started there and I was still learning <clears throat> about wine and um, the whole uh, pairing of cheese and wine. And um, I didn't know much. I only knew that um, Stilton really liked port. And, uh, you know, it was all very basic what I knew. And then one day um, I was sitting eating Conte and I was like, oh, you know, I need something with this. And a friend of mine came back and she'd been in Paris um, and she brought me a bottle of this. And I was like, well, you know, why would I want to drink Chardonnay with this beautiful cheese? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, really, really stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and then, and then um, she was like, no, no, you've got to try this, you've got to try this. Um, and so I did, and I was like, whoa, I found my perfect match. Um, but I was really, I mean, I was super excited, but I was also really frustrated because I just um, found out that um, I was pregnant. So I was like, I have to give up all these raw cheeses and, um, and I just found this wine that I just want to drink all the time. So, But yeah, and that's how, um, that's how I tasted Alice's wines the first time. And um, it, actually this year uh, was the first time um, I went to visit her and... Um, and I'm trying to not be um, too dogmatic about wine and um, so-called natural wine and um, low intervention wine, whatever we want to call it. Um, but I must say, standing in her vineyard um, and just seeing all the biodiversity and uh, really, you know, it sounds so cheesy, but really standing there and just listening to all the insects and you could really smell all the herbs and all the fruit that was growing around. I just think... Um, it's something different and um, it's not to say that that's the only way to grow and to to make wine but it really it, it made a really big impression on me and it was sort of for me a really profound experience um, uh, I I really I like uh, I like all her wines but this for me is is really special I think for me sort of how I my feel for the wines is that this is maybe the most serious out of the wines she does um, and I love her, you know, you, the, the first time I met her, you see this uh, quite petite lady, um, but she's so strong, like, it's unreal. Um, and, um, and she's out there and just, uh, you know, working in the vineyards every day and uh, she's so softly spoken and there's just this real poetry about her. And, um, and I feel that you feel that in the, in, in the wines as well. Um, I, I should maybe have decanted that this can be a bit um, reductive, but um, this is... For me, this is a wine that I just, I have a real emotional connection with. And when you first asked us to bring our favorite wines, I was sort of thinking what uh, represents the Jura the most. And, you know, I was also thinking about Ganeva and um, Obanoi and, uh, but I was sort of sure that these guys were going <laughs> to bring them. Um, but for me, it was just more about this is kind of what made me interested in the Jura. And this is, um, this is a wine that I feel emotionally connected with and I think wine is so much about that uh, it's that connection you have and the memories you have and maybe sometimes it's not um, the best technically so to speak but I think that um, that's how I always feel about the wines it's, it's how you emotionally connect with the wine to me that's the best wine absolutely sometimes you can't even explain why or, or, or shape yeah. why that I mean and sometimes it's not even a wine you like uh, yeah. sometimes it can be a moment I one of my like most memorable <laughs> yeah, one of my most memorable <laughs> meals and my memorable wine moments was uh, um, sear branzina with a bottle of Trevairo della Sala, which I just, I mean, you, you couldn't pay me to drink the wine now, but I was, you know, with the whole, the context in that moment and the way it kind of encapsulated it was uh, something special. But uh, no, it's, uh, I think that's one of the most magical things about wines and sometimes you don't know or you're not thinking of it, whether you're having a cosmic experience beneath a, you know, shimmering Milky Way or if it's, uh, you know, you're, you're caught blindsided by, a, you know, the first time you're having, you know, yeah. a despicable Chardonnay yeah. with, uh, yeah. with some Comte, it, it just, uh, I mean, I think that's one of the things that got me into wine. And, and but I think what Heidi says about being in the vineyard is really important yeah. because uh, the whole point about wine is it's a connection to place and to people, of course. But to be in the to, to remember when you are smelling the wine, to remember the vineyard and the smells, all those natural smells. This is why I think these biodynamic 
biodiverse vineyards are, are really magical places. And I think they, they can, re in the wine, that magic can be released. And that's why we're drinking it, is to evoke that sensation or, or to bring us to a particular place at a particular time. Yeah, when you're in, I mean, when you're in a, a vineyard that's so full of life, I, I mean, it's especially partly in contrast to the vineyards that don't have that energy, that don't have that, um, that care. I mean, there's something, you know, really captivating. I, mean, I think especially in a place like the Jura, where Heidi alluded to it earlier, I mean, the whole region has this sense of mystery. Um, uh, you said mystical, and I, yeah, it's, it's, and it's true. And, and especially then when you take that and go into the vineyards, and then you have this connection with that type of wine and like that kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a really, it can be a reverence. Yeah. And it's also very artisan. The cellars are really tiny, so it's not like you go from a beautiful vineyard into a vast, you know, sort of stainless steel encrusted cellar. I mean, it's all very intimate, very familial, uh, very traditional. It's like it definitely got its sort of feet in the past and very different. You know, it's like Jura really seems to be detached from pretty well everywhere else yeah. in France and, and elsewhere in terms of its feel. I mean, in it's, terms it's, of it's, its funny, you, know, you, you, you talk to your French friends who are, you know, are obviously not from the Jura and they're like, oh, yeah, that's some, that strange place that makes yellow wine. <laughs> they don't even know what, you know, what it is. Or, you know, there's some, maybe a chef from there. Okay, some nice cheeses, right? Yeah. But yeah, there's but really the, this the, unknown the, sort of thing. The, the, yeah, that, and that's exactly, I mean, when we're talking about, you know, um, as you were saying, you know, uh, it doesn't have your experience. And in, in general, you know, with Jura, it doesn't have to be perfect in terms of on the technical side. Because Jura, as you said, is so detached from anything else that actually it's more the artisanal work uh, rather than, again, big corporate wineries making, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, industrial wines so or technical wines so it's all it's all about it's all about uh, the origin where it comes from it's all about you know um, um, craftsmanship in terms of sort of craftsmanship you know work in the vineyard and uh, you know some of the wines you know might again not be perfect but they always always leave a mark and you know um, perfect personally I don't like the word perfect I, I like imperfection because it's more interesting and that's, I think, you know, it gives you so much pleasure. <laughs> Don't you think it's a beautiful irony that Louis Pasteur... Yeah, I was, sure. I was actually just going to mention that. You know, we're talking about this, this uh, technically, te technologically <laughs> devoid place in the home of Louis Pasteur at the same time. So it's, uh, you know, but, that, but that kind of, that's, that's a good kind of uh, point back to yeah. the, um, the history of Jura. I mean, it's kind of commercial. Um, it, it's it's uh, in, uh, in marketability, let's say, for so long, L left it kind of as a void where people weren't going for commercial ambition. It was, um, you were making wines in spite of commercial ambitions. It was, um, and I think that's kind of what's maybe insulated or protected the, um, the integrity, let's say, of, of the region's wines because people were doing it to, you know, as, as a dedication to the land, a dedication to their family's heritage or a dedication to uh, the region um, in spite of, uh, you know, commercial uh, realities that maybe would have led them somewhere else, you know. I mean, how many places have a wine like Vanjoon where you have to, have to age it for six years and a bit, uh, right, before you can release it? Uh, you know, it's, it's not funny. the most commercially viable. For it's sure. funny, a lot of the regions, you know, from many countries, but let's talk about France, they were on hype at a certain point of history and Jura was never. Mm. I mean, and that, that's funny, that's probably, you know, why, you know, it, just stay there despite of the fact that Pasteur came, you know, from round the corner and, you know, changed the, uh, the, 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 you know, the world, in, you know, when it comes to, you know, his methods. Uh, but it actually never really worked, you know, it was never reapplied there. It was never a big thing, you know, and... Um, yeah. You can't be a hero in your hometown. So I, so I sell wine in London, not Saskatoon, so... <laughs> uh, apropos of not particularly anything, but um, <laughs> the, um, I was looking at, um, like a uh, like a great map of of, um, of Jura, and basically, I mean, Chardonnay is you know we associate that with Burgundy, and the and the wines are sort of pretty well Burgundian style and sort of topped up and whatever, fine. Um, but there used to be an incredible number of indigenous grape varieties, most of which have now completely died out. So what we see with Sauvignon and Cusa is really the sort of the tail end of a, of a really artisan wine culture. I mean that goes for all over the world, from Italy to France, you know, throughout France and so on and so forth. But there are, there, are some, there are some really, really neat little grape varieties. And we see that Ganevar does one in which he has like 20 local grapes, but he cannot, he cannot vinify them separately because there's like, you know, like a few rows of vines. But he does, he has done a cuvee, uh, which is just of like the old 
Jorah grapes, you know, Petit Besclan, Gros Besclan, uh, Enfarinet, Isabelle, all this sort of Argent, whatever. And uh, <laughs> it had to be declassified to, to Van der Table or Van de France because the old grape varieties are not recognized anymore, you know, in Jura, which I think is like, it's typical bureaucracy. Yeah. So uh, I don't think France would ever have time for anything which is like authentic or indigenous. I think one thing that's, I also think is interesting about the Jura is, you know, it's a very agricultural agrarian region. Yeah. Um, and that's its heart. It's like, you know, it's kind of thing. People yeah, talk cities, about, right? the, you know, the breadbasket of France because um, you have all these amazing food products that come from there. Right. Uh, but yet it has this, this wine heritage. Um, so I think that's a really interesting combination where you find these regions that are a little bit forgotten about, that are very agrarian um, and very, you know, like kind of peasanty in a way, yeah. uh, but then have this, you know, interesting wine, this wine side. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it very special. I think, you know, I think one of the, th that, that kind of leads me to one of the things that I think about a lot with Jura that frustrates me a lot. And it's not, it's not nothing about the region. It's about this idea, um, I think because people who, who, like us, have discovered the region, it inspires so much passion. Um, and I think that sometimes people who maybe aren't in wine or aren't uh, as infatuated with the region or haven't had these epiphanies that we have um, regard the wines as maybe being a bit esoteric or that maybe there's, that's perpetuated by the industry itself. But when you taste these wines, or you know, whether you're tasting it with Comte in, in a restaurant, I mean, there's something just, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a wine geek. You don't have to be all the way down the rabbit hole with these wines. They're just, you know, objectively with, you know, with blinders on. They're phenomenal wines. I mean, it's uh, whether it's in a Souvois style or, you know, um, which people who, again, maybe aren't as uh, engaged with the, the Ouye wines or some of these. The, the, you know, this is such an energetic wine. I mean, this is just Amazing. really electrifyingly uh, tense and captivating Chardonnay. And you know, people who dismiss Jura as some sort of fringe or niche or too, um, you know, uh, too out there as a style are missing um, what I think is uh, some of the most exciting stuff about it is there's the heritage. But just you taste these wines. Um, it doesn't matter what you like. I mean, if you are the most classical Burgundian, um, you know, on premier buyer, you, you can't deny some of the, just the pure uh, class of these wines. But I think you touch on the other really important side. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the history and the tradition and stuff and how that has such meaning in the wines and the connection. But actually, you also have this just amazingly exciting wine scene um, with young vignerons, uh, people just working in a great way, working with each other, collaborative, um, creating these just, like, amazing wines that you just want to drink, that are just, you know, regardless of where they're from. Uh, and I think that's the other side of the show that's so exciting. It is true that one key turning point, I think, in the Jura wine, is re very recent Jura history, is, well, before the majority of the wines were made in a non ouye style, so, you know, not topped up, so massive, you know, personality on the nose, if you want to call it like that. Um, and uh, so with the development of the floor and all that it entails in terms of aromatics, to like topped up styles with it now basically the, the bread and butter for everybody. And I think that is one of the key that has made Jura more uh, Jura wines more accessible. Do you think that that's in the same way, let's say that um, the Michel Rolandification of emerging <laughs> regions establishes the credibility of, say, um, let's say you know Bulgarian Cabernet? You have someone like that comes in in a very commercial international style to say, look, we can make wines of quality in this defined parameter in these regions. Do you think that there's kind of a parallel with Ouye wines in, uh, from a terroir expression that, look, this is just in that they've been, um, they've established or in a universal language, let's say, uh, the communicated the credibility or the validity of the terroir or of uh, the potential of through that style because it's more easy to understand? Yeah. I think it's easy to understand that, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, I, I'd like, you know, to know your opinion about that. I mean, I think it's easy to understand the Nanoye style because you don't have, you know, the, uh, the development of the floor and, you know, all the, um, all the uh, aromas that you get out of non ouye style wine, they tend to overpower the rest, the rest of the wine. So, um, especially, you know, uh, then it comes to the hand of the wine you know, of the of the vigneron to kind of uh, t t tame it all down. But it's easier because they're more readable because it's what we are used, what people are used to drink. And again, I'm not defending non ouye uh, ouye style rather than non ouye because I'm a big fan of both. And you know. Um, but as I said, I think it made the wines a bit more easier to understand. And, uh, uh, but in that case, showcasing really 
other set of characteristics. So it could be, you know, the, there are the different different kind of soils, different kind of uh, uh, climate that we find uh, that we find in Jura. Funny enough, I think actually maybe you see like a bit of a switch in the Jura now, where people are moving away from the traditional way of yeah. making wine sous vol under floor. Um, Long, super long aging, and uh, you know that stuff to making this kind of fresher, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. topped up style, um, and maybe you're losing even a, perhaps a little bit of the tradition. I don't know where. I, th what will oh, I think in the future. yeah, that's a um, that's a good point. I mean, there it's you could say the commercial success of Lea wines is a threat to the. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's cash flow thing, right? It's like, if, yeah, yeah. are you going to make gin or are you going to make whiskey? Uh, <laughs> so at the end of the day, they might, at Jura, they might produce Zil bottles, but you know. I mean, uh, the, the, you know, the non year style will always appeal more to the super niche, like us, you know, in a, in a way, where, whereas, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the other style will be actually, could open up the sort of, uh, the audience and say, okay, that's what we do in Jura, not only that, we also do that. And, uh, well, so I, well, I think I disagree with that. I think, I think that's one of the things with it. We, you know, we assume, I think we, we, we falsely assume that, um, that the sous style, this oxidative uh, um, style, is 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 too niche for people's palates. I think it's not true at all. I'm, my wife is a perfect example. She doesn't work in wine. Um, she's a good palate. She has f far better taste than I do in wines. Um, but the first wine she ever called me to bring back from work, she said that we had the night before was Domi Macle Chateau Chalon. She's like, you need to bring me another bottle of that. <laughs> and she loves sous style. She loves, there's, I mean, and I think if people love marzipan or they love some if, if whiskey drinkers or sherry lovers, obviously, there's, I think there's just a, a wonderful appeal. It's not for everyone, but I do think you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be professional to, to love but this that, 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 But how do you discover that, it? And that I think also that's touches, that also touches on one of the great things of the Jura, which um, is food and wine pairing. Yeah. You know, and, and you have that a, that aged comte um, with a bit of you know Chateau Chalon or Van June, and it's just like boom, <laughs> you know, like that the earth heavens open, uh, and, yeah. and that's, that's a great that's, that's a great the thing year style for nowadays. To, nowadays it's a second step, so you now you get into that, and then you get into no new year. It's in, I, I think, and again, I, I'm it's you know it's, I'm not I don't have the truth you know about just that I. I think the change from the the, the non year start to the UE has put some focus on the on, on the Jura. Then for the new consumers that get into the Jura, the first step to then appreciate the non year, I think, is to go through the proper channel, <laughs> which is stylistically. Then I'm not saying one is better than the other. Mm. I guess. You know, but from the growers' point of view, better. it's a bit more probably complex than than either or. So. Yeah, there's there's top up, there's and there's souvoir, and souvoir are, are can be uh, oxidative or semi oxidative or barely oxidative. Uh, you can go you can go Sauvignon souvoir, or you can go Van Jeune, You can go partially topped up. It's like we saw this. There was a sherry tasting yesterday. Basically, every house or every grower, in the case of Jura, has their own method of making the wines. And I would say go further, to, and I, I, want, I don't want to use the word cross-contamination to sound like an accident, but you taste topped up wines and they are aged in voile casks. There's, there's always a, like a flavor of like that sort of yeasty yeah. umami mm -hmm. sort of thing that's coming through. And you think that's definitely from the Jura because they're using Jura casks and you know because then no one's using new barrels anymore so they're switching around on the barrels and there's like flavoring agents sort of like going back and forth. And I think that's really intriguing because I don't want it to be either or. I don't want it to be dogmatic. No, Ganavar is a classic example of, of like Mr. Top Up, Mr. Top Up. But of course, he makes at least five, six, seven, eight now Souvoir styles, or you know, you know, because he's play, he's and he and he plays around. You know, he does the he does the nine year. Uh, I was going to bring a bottle of that, but oh. I couldn't find it. Uh, the nine year <laughs> topped up. Yeah. Then there's a the prestige, which was which was his non oxidative style. To, to, you know, and then no, it was non oxidative. Oh, I can't can't even remember <laughs> souvoir style. <laughs> and then and then there's a Sauvignon Chardonnay, which is topped up, yeah. and one which isn't. So pretty well. I mean, when you're doing so many the micro vinification, and they make a load of cuvées, and we talked about Bonnard and Ganavar. 
and even Uyon, make you know topped up, non topped up yeah. star. Everyone is micro vinified. Every, there's like there's a barrel for every eventuality and probably every market and every palette. But I agree with you in the sense that obviously the route to market, oh, a horrible word, is, yeah. <laughs> is, is 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 to go through the is to go through sort of let's say the more approachable style, the more topped up style, because people recognise that. And even if it's just a touch different, a touch saltier, a touch umamier no word, uh, then, then of course, then it's only a short step to the next style and a short step to the next style. So that's the way to get Jura, you know, you know working, I suppose, in a more... You and did you sell both styles at Otomi or...? No, do... no, um, at the moment, no. So at the moment, um, I think we only have um, the uh, Rosé Matin, the yes. uh, Savagnin. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I was thinking about bringing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's, a, I mean, for me, he's so I underrated uh, yes. as a winemaker. He's, I mean, his wines, for me, they have this ethereal dreaminess yeah. about yeah. them. Yeah. Um, but um, That's the, my first wine that I pour for, like, Burgundy Fanatics. So, like, I don't drink German. Taste yeah. this, and if you can't like it, get out. This wine's really pretty amazing. I just think that it's so, um, it's like electric. It's just, um, the acidity is insane and just really, yeah. I mean, I was quite, I was happy, sad kind of thing that it sold so well at Nopi because uh, the allocation was so small, so it was gone quite um, <laughs> quickly. And uh, it was a bit like, uh, I want you to have it, but I don't really want you to have it. <laughs> and, uh, so next time I, I, I come to Nopi, I have to ask because it's all the list. <laughs> it's Eden. <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, it's hard, isn't it? Sometimes when you do wine lists and there uh, are things, and you have maybe six or twelve bottles, and, um, and you really want to sell it, but at the same time, there's a part of you that's like, actually no. <laughs> I, I actually do hide. <laughs> I, I, I hide um, some wines. Which as well. I, I'm sure some years from now I'll probably probably find some uh, you know, Canavao or Rupert or Wine. I think, I, I think we all have the same oh, secret guilt. <laughs> it's uh, it's the uh, you know the. Um, the Gollum effect, as I like to call it, <laughs> the precious. And I think you know Heidi, electric is really I think the the principal uh, thing that I think of for my own for my own notes in this. It just uh, it's so much energy and tension and precision as well. And, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll maybe we'll talk about this more with Miroir as well. But it's really interesting. We'll be tasting two Chardonnays from Jura, both sans soufre as well, like without sulfur. Um, and you know. I think people that maybe aren't, that don't taste as many wines, I mean, there's a lot of apprehension or nervousness about these kinds of wines, and there's like, oh, well, it's going to be faulted rubber. I mean, you taste this, and you taste the Miramar. I mean, these are such precise tense. I mean, they, they're the antithesis of what every negative assumption that people have about with these sans Silver wines with yeah. Chardonnay. Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, I, mean, you gave this to the, I mean, you gave this to 99% of the people. They wouldn't think it's Chardonnay. No. Um, it's something that's just... Magic. So, Alessia, do you want to tell us about uh, what wine you brought tonight? Well, yeah, um, be very happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting well, you know, for this. That, 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 that can back me up because you know, obviously, you know, it's got, it gets, you know, um, it's big allocations every year. You know, that he <laughs> keeps jeal jealously in his own cellar. Um, you know, I mean, um, here we we having the uh, Mizuiro uh, 2013 from Domaine de Miroir, which is. Uh, very new, uh, first vintage was 2010 or 11, if, I think, if, I, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, so it's a funny story, you know, it's, um, again, we're not going, that's not a traditional winery in terms of, it's been established for, you know, 20, 30, 50 years in Jura. Is actually, the owner is a Japanese guy um, uh, called Kenjiro. Um, and uh, he started the winery after being, uh, he worked in a multi Japanese multinational years ago and then, you know, he decided to give it up, uh, as you do, and studied French first, then moved moved to France, and he worked in Alsace, you know, Bruno Schuller, and then he got in touch with, uh, with Geneva. He worked with Geneva that helped him uh, finding his a three-hectare plot in Cruz, uh, which is not very far, always from, from Geneva, always in Sidrevermont. And which, uh, well, it, it all started, so he also makes several cuvées, not 35 uh, so far, I mean, three actors, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, the Mizuiro is one of them. It comes from, um, um, actually, a vineyard, which is south, you know, west, southwest um, position, again, about 300, 300, you know, 300 meters elevation. 
And uh, the guy, what they really, what they really, apart from being like a, a, a unicorn wine, which is you know now I think unicorn is the word for uh, what what for Parker was a cult wine, you know the you know the, the word cult, you know <laughs> cult reminds you of Bordeaux, big you know big wines and blah. A unicorn wine is more like for it's a, the, the newer generation of uh, <laughs> rarity. Yes, it's a unicorn. It's somebody that um, I think uh, out of nowhere, you know, came down to Jura and with actually very little experience. You know, it's not that he studied and then he made he did ten harvests before starting his own thing, and he came out with this wine, which is absolutely minimalistic in the sense of. Uh, wine making in terms of you know is working you know is all working by dynamic in the vineyard of course but in terms of style the purity the chisel of, of the uh, uh, that you find these wines they are I think not that common in Jura even among you know the the really top producer I find the really the details and the the spikes of this wine I like the word the spikes really don't unicorn do. spikes unicorn yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to get these wines and um, uh, I got so lucky to find actually some bottles uh, on the internet in the uh, wine shop in Paris uh, the Cap de Papi, I think we all know that um, I it, I was the the, uh, uh, the good time good spot at the good time so I found that they still had like some bottles and they bought some and after that, I didn't manage to get any more. So I mean, it's like, uh, but then I got to taste it several times, and it was always like, you know, a chill in the spine, uh, kind of sensation, uh, which I think uh, the Octavan uh, is on the same sort of wavelength, wavelength. I like to describe it. It's not particularly very pleasant image, but it gives you kind of an idea. It's like, you know, your nails on a blackboard, uh, kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> For the people who are not uh, at our memorable Jura tasting at the Remedy, you, Derek. <laughs> was it just me? Uh, yes, exactly. it was just you. Everybody else in this room That's was there. We're here today. Everybody, yes, was sort of there. I think uh, we had 16 bottles of various wonderfulness, but there was nothing quite like this. There was something about the way the wine evolved, which is quite remarkable. It was like a living wine in every sense, but I, I don't think I ever recall wine tasting that way. And I couldn't really put my finger on it other than saying it so reminded me of, of a sake. And I, I don't know whether it's associated with Kenjiro Kagami and being Japanese, but there was this like incredible quality in the mouth um, and a moving quality and a sort of warmth of the wine and a tsunami, savory, can't, can't put, I can't describe it, but it, it was definitely different, wasn't it, I think? No, and there's actually an interesting vintage 2013, oh. which was, you know, very difficult and, and challenging. And, uh, uh, like all vintages of Jura. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think thirteen. You know, there was no mercy for the, for uh, you know, for the uh, for the vigneron, and I think um, he managed to pull out a beauty. And again, especially you know, uh, when you say taste, uh, it's got some sac sake or reminiscent yeah. yeah. on the nose. The first thing that strikes is you know exactly this: this sort of faded rose kind of. Um, you know, you get this. You know, in a, in a sake and. And again, we, you know, another, uh, as I said before, both of these sans souffre, both of these without sulfur, and just incredibly clean, um, tense, precise, elegant wines. I mean, there's just, uh, um, I mean, there's a quite a, in, in comparison, this one's obviously got quite a bit more power on the nose. Um, what? The, I, I, the miroir for me, it's a bit more of this kind of, uh, um, I always kind of refrain from going masculine, feminine kind of aromatic comparisons, but. Um, it has this uh, um, savoriness, I guess, that uh, uh, um, in, in with that kind of it's the, like the, the floral character. The octavon, I think, is kind of a higher note, um, yeah. you know, tight, tighter pitched, and then this is kind of that more bass, yeah. you know, yeah. deeper notes, more. Definitely. And very wild. I mean, yeah. I, I'm getting like sort of wild herbs and, and whatever, and it's sort of almost like meaty sort of it's meat, meat stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. yeah. It's got this kind of like uh, um, like braised meat. Yeah. Um, yeah. These spices, this kind of... Uh, it's, it's very, 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 very complex. And again, you know, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have, again, uh, obviously the depth, but that I would say more because of a vintage uh, related issue. But in terms of complexity, this one is so much, it's so, it's so expressive and it's got these, these umami notes in the mouth that is just, they are, they are uh, 
astounding, you know. The, um, but it's super interesting that two wines that are, um, you know, same grape, same region, yeah. yet so profoundly different. This is 13. Um, 13, yeah. And, and made by two very humble people who, you know, think and work in a very similar way. Quiet, um, quietly profound. I mean, they're both yeah, yeah. Um, have this so, understated, like, like, um, you know. Like um, people who make them. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, when we, I had this amazing fanboy moment uh, a year and a half ago when I got to meet Kenjiro. Um, and I had no idea he was going to be there. I had no idea he was coming. It was just, hey, do you want to come taste these wines? And I said, yeah, sure. You had me at Jura. And then I walk up and you see this, you know, five foot six. I don't know what that is in centimeters, but it's not many centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> walking up with this little case of, uh, you know, um, this with the miroir label on the side. I'm just like, oh my God, I'm about to taste not only like, it's one thing you're you're looking for these wines to just find a bottle to try, and then all of a sudden I get blindsided with the man himself and like his entire like portfolio just quietly and uh, you know uh, walking up to this table and I was just you know I've never it was the most starstruck I think I've ever I've ever been with uh, um, anyone and um, then I got to taste them all and there's just you know as you said he's so humble he's so um, soft spoken and yeah. so um, you know timid almost and there's this just subtle, profound, and quiet, you know, prof um, you know, profound experience you have when you taste these wines. It was just, it was a really, it was really captivating. And, you know, he's just, he's thanking everyone for tasting his wine. You're like, we, we would, I would literally shove people out of my way to taste these wines. Um, and to have this was such a, a captivating experience. And then just after that, we had the, um, there was the Jura seminar with, right. uh, with we, Wink. And, yes. uh, and we pushed him in, yes. Yeah, and yes. so then, yes. so it was a bunch of people, this was a lot of people's introduction to um, the wines of Jura. And then you have, <laughs> And Kinjiro, <laughs> Kinjiro there, and it's like, this is Kinjiro's Pulsar, and they're talking about Pulsar, I'm like, this, and you want to stand up and kind of shout at everyone, like, this is crazy, that this is happening right now, that you get to be, that we're all experiencing this. And his, his Pulsar as well, it's just like, yes. ethereal, I mean, it just had this finesse, and it's, it's interesting, I've tasted quite a few, and you know, Labe makes a very, um, um, Julien Labe makes a, a, a really nice Pulsar as well, and it, they could not be more opposite, and um, it's nice to see, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, I have a preference for, for one style or the other, but just to see these indigenous grapes with these cult producers and again with their own, you know, seeing their personalities reflected in these wines is uh, it's really cool. That's a really important point, actually. We thought with this is the other element of terroir, isn't it? It's about the personality of the grower as reflected through their wine. So, you know, although he's borrowed Ganavar's equipment and, you know, he's in the same blah, blah, blah region, um, the whites are diametrically. I mean, you could never confuse them. They are so, so particular and wild and natural and purer than pure. It's not, these, are, these are purer than pure, but, but in a different way. And uh, it must be something to do. I do recognize something a bit of the Schuller in the wines in terms of the wildness. I mean, Schuller's just uncontrolled, but this is like a bit more, <laughs> a bit more har harmonious in terms of its wildness. And I think the other important thing about all the wines we've tried so far is their indigenous yeast ferment. So, um, so they have that specific signature of, of the vineyards and the winery. So that's unique. That can never be replicated anywhere else. So, so these wines will always have that sort of identity. Then the other element of the artisanship in, in terms of most of these people, I mean, Ian Ganavar with his 40 blah cuvées, we're still talking about 10 hectares, uh, and I'm sure the rest are, you know, three, you're talking three hectares and very tiny vineyard. They must know intimately the vineyards, the way, the way, they, the way they work, you know, sort of like, you know, how high they are up, you know, how much sun they're getting, when they're going to be harvesting, you know, all these sort of things. And, they, and I suppose human beings are a bit like sort of computer or processors. They process that information and, and make the decision and but that's their decision it's a very personal thing and then the wine and then they let the wine sort of flow and they're sort of like they're just accompanying it on the way that's what makes the wine sort of natural is is there there's a one the human element is the decide oh we're going to harvest and I'm, yeah i'm going to use that barrel that barrel or that part of the cellar or that part of the cellar every single decision you make is going to influence the wine in in a tiny little way even if it's like i'm putting it into that barrel in that corner of the cellar and that corner of the cellar is a micro uh, degree centigrade cooler than that. It's, it's it, you know, we, we look at Ganavar cellar, you know, the temperatures are crazily different all throughout, you know, whether you're in the bottom or the top of the cellar. These make, all these things impact on the flavor of the wine. You could say that's the terroir, the terroir of the cellar, the terroir of the human being, the terroir of the winery, and all those multiple indigenous yeasts, which you can only really get 
in a biodynamic vineyard where you have a really healthy population of quite strong yeast competing against each other and giving, and in every vintage, it will be different, th th that combination, basically. That's why we keep drinking. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, Dave, do you want to tell us a bit about the wine you brought today? Absolutely. So, kind of se segueing uh, a little bit back to the traditional side of the Jura. Uh, this is, I think, you know, it's fair to say, perhaps one of the very top producers of Vanjun, or in this case, uh, Chateau Chalon. Uh, from the Jura, and this is uh, Domaine Mackel. They are based in this amazingly pretty little village of Chateau Chalon, which sits up on this, this little perch of a cliff overlooking the vineyards of Chateau Chalon. And, you know, it's just one of those iconic little beautiful places in the Jura. Probably the most, you know, certainly I think the most famous region, uh, sub-region within the Jura as well. And they are probably the most famous producer of Chateau Chalon. Uh, a very, going back to Heidi's point uh, about kind of the mystical, mysterious side of the Jura, you know, a very quiet, secretive almost um, family that you, you know, it's, it's very hard to actually go and visit them. It's very hard to, um, to get the, to tr even try their wine sometimes. I mean, you, do, you, you see them perhaps more than uh, Kinjiro's wines, but to me they are really the epitome of of the tra traditional oxidative side of, of Jura wines. So this is, of course, 100% Sauvignon, which it must be to be a Vanjun, or in this case, a Vanjun from Chateau Chalon, uh, which is the most famous appellation for Vanjun in the Jura. And you know, to me, this is really the epitome of, of the traditional oxidative side of, of winemaking in the Jura. Um, but the bottle itself is called a Clavelon. It is 62 centiliters, uh, which as you know, legend goes in the Jura, is the amount of wine that would actually evaporate when you have, starting with a one liter barrel of Banjun, if you did such a thing, and you let it age for six years and about two, three months, which is what it must do to be a, a Banjun or a Chateau Chalon. And it is that 380 or so, um, you know, milliliters, centiliters, whatever, of wine that would evaporate and hence give you that much wine left. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an amazingly cool bo little bottle. I think even uh, for some time in, in the U.S., you weren't actually officially allowed to import this wine <laughs> simply, bizarrely, stupidly, because um, it wasn't a regulated size. You know, there was no such thing as 62. <laughs> so, <laughs> Neil Rosenthal, I think. There's, uh, I remember reading some story about this. Uh, I can't probably chuck some in his suitcase. And yeah, I think there was some sort of <laughs> yeah. like, like you know, smuggling in of uh, Clavelins of, uh, um, of Van Jones to get it into the U.S. You know, and another thing that's, um, you know, I think all of us can agree on that's amazing about wine is when you have you know, those moments where you try something that's like properly old, um, and yet maybe you, it only tastes like it's actually you know, a fraction of how old it is. And I was lucky enough to try some, some very old Chateau Chalon in the Jura one time, and it's in a wine that can just age for, forever. Yeah. Um, really, it's, uh, it's, it's, ama it's amazing. Um, this, these are the wines that are designed to you know, be drunk after 20, 30, 40 years or more. So you know, this is a, um, one that we probably, it's only a little baby in its youth at the moment. We had that, um, oh, what used to be a hedonism, uh, 1774 Van Joan from the uh, Arbois that came from one of the uh, Presse de Van auctions a few years ago. Did you try it? Yeah, it's a little out of my price range. <laughs> <laughs> like, Come on, little Corvid. Come on, little Corvid. No one's going to notice. <laughs> Retailed it for like, I don't know, 75,000 pounds of bottle or something. Didn't take that much. Yeah, it didn't... Uh, didn't come, it wasn't part of my bonus structure. <laughs> it's, uh, it's crazy, I mean, just how timeless some of these wines are. No, bonkers, and you know, these, are, these are the wines that really are the epitome of the Jura, and, and, and to be paired with the food of the Jura. Mm -hmm. um, you know, amazing to drink on its own, but you know, give me a 36 age month Comte with this any day. And, and there's actually something you can drink as an aperitivo. I mean, I remember a glorious aperitivo with a great friend uh, in Norway, I know. Um, uh, we had the aperitivo with uh, the Vanjon from uh, Ganeva and uh, side by side with the substance from Celos, obviously that goes off topic, but 
together, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, it was amazing. I mean, you know, it's just the best ability you, you can over, you can, you can hope for. And actually, it's, uh, there's got there's always so much drinkability and there's always so much going on, but it's never, it's never, never heavy. I mean, mm, they yeah. don't feel saturated yeah. by it. And I, think, I think that's a sign of the great Souvoir um, wines or and of this style is that, 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 density, that concentration and in intensity, but also simultaneous almost weightlessness in terms yeah. of uh, ethereal quality. And you know, you can feel somewhere, um, maybe there's a bit, they're a bit too squat, they sit on your palate too heavy and they're quite gratuitous and, and, um, and, and, and still, still really nice to drink and really enjoyable and great pairings and great and all that stuff. But the, what I always find with Chateau Chalon from Macaulay is it just has this intense captivation in when I taste it, but it also, it's really lifted and really ethereal, and um, um, I always find that really interesting. You know, you compare it to say Poufinis, which is very cheesy and really heavy and kind of wild, or um, 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 in, in comparison. And this is always. Uh, um, Do we know how uh, these wines are made? Because there is like there's two ways of doing it. This one is is not to top up, and the other one is to top up. So you can still top up a Souvoir wine, uh, and you get something. I, I'm sure Ganava does because his his wines are so elegant. It's, his his Van Jones is, is is like you know more elegant than his Suv his other yeah, Suvoir yeah, wines, <laughs> which is which is <laughs> odd, which is that and this oh, it's, it's like looking at the color, it's so light and ethereal, and it bears the fourteen percent you know absolutely beautifully. It's um, it's like lovely sort of sinuous and and and, and fresh on the palate. So you would unless you said about oh yeah, I'd make a great parity. Yeah. I think yeah, <laughs> Sur surprisingly not heavy at all. Yeah, and it's interesting that you do find some really incredible Van Jones. I mean, obviously Chateau Chalon is the most famous appellation for Van Jones, and they are the, the, the top of that. But you can find some r amazing Van Jones outside of this little area down where Ganeva is, yeah. up where Ovenois is. It's funny, Ganeva's Souvoir wines have kind of started to become my favorite wines that he does, which is, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's, I call it ironic, but it's interesting to me anyway. But they're, they're beautiful, all, all of his cuvées. Um, you know, the Macle, they do the um, Côte du Jour, which is also Souval, I think, for three years. Yeah. Which is a mix of, I think it's predominantly Chardonnay and a bit of Sauvignon, or vice versa. 80-20, I think. Yes. 80 Chardonnay, 20 Sauvignon. Um, it really has a much, it doesn't have the elegance of this, of the Chateau Chalain. Obviously, it's different, different, yeah. different aging and, and stuff, but it, um, it's, uh, yeah, this wine always stands out to me. This is the, yeah, this is the wine my wife called me at work the next day and was like, <laughs> bring another <laughs> bottle of this home. It was... Um, and, and, and but that's why I think you know this this style of wines is so approachable to people that will never try it. I mean, and if there's one you know there's so many types of wines that I say people need to try, and it's not specific wines necessarily, but um, getting wines that taste like this or have these characteristics that are so different from you know um, just your, your your typical you know your Californian Chardonnay or whatever whatever style of wine. People, there's so many people who don't know that they will love this style of wine that have never tried it, and it's so hard to get them in front of people because they're so rare, and there's other kind of forms, but I, I think it's so crucial for people who have any bit of curiosity in wine um, or in drinking alcoholic <laughs> beverages of any, of any, of any side, uh, type to try to discover and, and engage with some of these because, uh, as I said, you know, my wife is not a wine professional, is not a wine geek, she has great taste, but um, you know, there's so many people that I've poured wines like this for, oh, I've poured Ganava, um, Cuvée Prestige for, that are good friends that say, oh my gosh, this is something I've never had before, and they're ecstatic about it. And you know, they're the kind of people, you know, they're, they're drinking Blossom Hill or you know, As Martini Prosecco. A, you don't need to be uh, a geek. You don't need to be um, you know, um, reading every book uh, on these regions to appreciate these wines. And, and hopefully that that will help people discover some of them. But I think it's, uh, um, you know, if anybody's listening to this podcast or watching this video that's never uh, tasted some of these wines, I would really implore them to, to, to call someone and try it. Yeah. But I think it's also because there's something, um, actually I think there's something familiar about the wine. So sometimes you can present the wine uh, like a crazy uh, skin contact wine to someone and they can't really find anything in the wine that um, they're familiar with. And I think there's something um, in these wines for me, and I don't know if it's because, you know, I've had the, you know, the, the pleasure to try so many of them, but I think there's something quite, it's not, um, it doesn't kind of like make you go, oh, 
you know, I don't understand this. It's more, I think, of, uh, I think there is something that sort of lures you back and you're kind of like, oh, it's almost like there's something comforting rather yeah, than yeah. it makes you... But we've chosen wines, have we not, that we would want to drink, if we could drink a whole bottle of them. <laughs> yes, that we would drink happily because there's, there's a pleasure element. I, and I think, I think perhaps Jura, to go back to something Alessio was saying earlier, um, th th there was a sense that, you know, the wines were oxidative, sort of brown, like... Mm cheesy, demanding, nothing more, more to be admired than to be drunk. And of course, now we want to drink the wines. So whether the winemaking has changed or, or whether we're, we are isolating certain growers who we think are emblematic of the best of Jorah and the most exciting styles that, that we like to drink. But I actually think there are more and more wines being made in this style. I think there, there's a move away from the sort of like hard oxidative style into something which is much more I mean, it's still complex, amazingly complex. In fact, more complex because you can taste the terroir, the wine, you know, the venosity, the, the ele but, but it's elegant and the alcohol levels have dropped and they're, they're much more serviceable with food, you know, they're much more all purpose. So it's great to we talk about the Comte and the, and the, and the, the big Jura stew, but it, <laughs> we can't always be, have a bit of Comte in our back pocket, you know, just like bring it out. Well, we could, I suppose. <laughs> At the end of the day, I mean, it's, you know, going back to the roots, you know, with the, with the Jura, it's always going to be, if we really want, if people want to understand where Jura comes from, we have to go back to that, you know, kind of start. And I agree with you, you know, some, you know, uh, uh, some people will, will find it appealing. Uh, but I think what it's more interesting is that would be for people that are not used to drink this kind of style, it's going to be... Um, a great way to push the boundaries in terms of uh, because don't let's not forget that uh, yes you know uh, also in other countries in the world people are, are working now are trying actually to, not to replicate but to uh, get some uh, some of the ideas some of the ideas from Jura to work with uh, Nonuye you know in Australia in uh, in South Africa uh, in Italy uh, and that's uh, and that's you know a, a, a voyage of discovery also to a, a kind of winemaking style that is not germane to other countries or even in France outside of Jura. So. Um, well, thanks everyone. This has been a great evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for bringing some amazing special wines to share. And uh, and as always, thanks for uh, the great insights. It's been a, it's been great. I mean, this has really been a special uh, conversation, and uh, I hope people listening will look for some of these wines or explore and discover the wines of Jura like we have. Cheers. 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 Jura wine always brings cool people together. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not talk about yourself. But do we really want people to discover these wines? There's so, there's so little of them. <laughs> you can, you can Why not? Why not? Why not? <laughs> Hold on, okay, cheers. <laughs>